Okay, so today I'm very happy to introduce Professor Adrian Del Maestro from the University of Vermont, um, who will be talking at the Quantum Fluids and Isolation Seminar Series today. So Professor Del Maestro got his Bachelor of Science from the University of Waterloo in 2002, and he got his Master's of Science from the University of Waterloo in 2003 before going on to Yale, L, where he got a master's in 2005, and then he got his, ultimately got his PhD from Harvard in 2008. He postdoced in two, uh, starting in 2008 at the University of British Columbia. And then in uh, 2010, he went to the Institute for Quantum Matter, where he postdoced, and then finally became professor at the University of Vermont in 2011. So he's been a director of the Vermont Advanced Computing Corps in Burlington, Vermont. He's the recipient of several awards and numerous multi-million dollar grants. And today he'll be talking about how uh, one-dimensional superfluidity. So please help me in welcoming and either virtually or by unmuting ourselves, Professor Adrian Del Maestro. Thanks, Josh. Uh, all right, so let me share my screen here. And... All right, so it's a, it's a lot of fun to, to give this, this talk, especially because I've known Josh for a very long time. In fact, I think Josh might have been one of the very first students that ever walked into my office in, in Vermont in my like, first week uh, as, a, as a junior professor there. Um, so it's fun to, to tell you this talk, tell you about this talk. And also, you know, this, this talk is kind of the culmination of uh, a lot of work that's been going on for the last 10 plus years. Um, our quest to kind of realize a, a one-dimensional superfluid, and, and we're not there yet, but we're much closer than we were, uh, a high-density superfluid made out of helium-4. Um, it's really the combination of two orthogonal approaches, and I will definitely talk about one, and, and time permitting, um, I'll get to the other one. And by all means, please stop me, unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, some of this stuff may be more familiar and, and some less familiar to people. Uh, so this is work that, the, has happened with one of my graduate students, Nathan Nichols at UVM, uh, Ben Rosenau in Leipzig, a longtime collaborator, and then really three different experimental groups. Uh, the first is Guillaume Gervais and, and his student Pierre-Francois Duc at, at McGill University, um, then Peter Taborik in, in Irvine, and, uh, and then finally Paul Sokol's group uh, with uh, Garfield uh, in, in Indiana and, and Tim Crisk, who's an alumni of Paul's group and, and did some of the uh, neutron scattering. This is work that was supported by a collaborative uh, DMR grant between Paul and myself um, with supercomputing facilities uh, coming from both the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure Award and, and XSEED and the Vermont Advanced Computing Corps. Uh, the first part, some of the stuff is now a couple years old. Uh, this is a paper I wrote with Baron Rosenau on, on uh, vortices and dissipation in, in mesoscale superfluids. And then the provided I get to it, the stuff at the end is, is a paper that we're really you know, only a day or so hopefully away from putting on the archive. So look for that on, uh, on networks of, of low dimensional pores. All right, so the, the motivation, uh, which is often the motivation for these types of things, is we want to really access universal physics in, in one dimension. Um, one dimension is interesting to us for all the usual reasons, but uh, predominantly that you know, it's, it's an interesting playground to, to test things on. Um, interactions are very important. All excitations are collective. There's no effective quasi-particle description. If you, you know, disturb the system at some point or if you have propagation through the system, then all other particles tend to be involved. So by definition, it's a many-body problem. Um, another thing that's quite interesting for us is the idea of both Fermi correspondence. Uh, the idea that, you know, how do we usually test whether a wave function is, is bosonic or fermionic? Well, we just ask about the you know, first quantization, we would ask about the interchange of two coordinates. Um, and whether we got a negative sign back or not would tell us whether we have a bosonic or fermionic many particle state. Um, but if we're in strictly one dimension and we have hardcore particles, then we actually don't have the geometric space to be able to do that interchange. Uh, and so it turns out that many of the low energy properties um, of the system are completely universal between bosons and fermions. Uh, if you look at, for example, energies and excitations of hardcore bosons versus free fermions, they look, uh, they look indistinguishable in, in 1D. And of course, at short distances um, and with things like you know, density density correlations, we could tell them apart, but the kind of long distance behavior could potentially be universal. And so why then is, you know, this is an interesting scenario for helium, Well, we have these two isotopes of helium shown here uh, with these two phase diagrams, helium-4 and uh, helium-3, one being bosonic and one being fermionic, and both having a superfluid phase, which I'll, I'll talk more about later on. And so the idea would be if we could 
somehow come up with a, a geometry by which we could realize a one-dimensional superfluid um, of helium, then we could, in that same geometry, could test just by changing the isotope and even mixtures thereof, helium-4 and helium-3, and, and, and test this kind of universal post fermi correspondence. The final piece is the, the lack of any long-range order, so everything's highly fluctuating, even at, at zero Kelvin. I can't break any continuous symmetries here. So this, you know, the description of the system is, is universal in the sense that it's some quantum hydrodynamics that's emergent. Uh, people call this a Lettinger liquid or Tamanaga Lettinger liquid. And the beauty there, of course, is even though this is a strongly interacting many particle system, um, we can actually compute many things, compute some correlation functions. And, you know, for example, the two types of order that we might expect in the superfluid system would be either something like a, a Bose-Einstein condensate or a superfluid, which would be characterized by a condensate fraction that in this case in 1D is, is, is decaying, um, or something like positional order, a quasi-solid. And here we see that the pair correlation function, this is just the, the expectation value of the density-density correlation function, has this rather strong decay. And everything is sort of characterized by an overall energy scale, um, the, the velocity of, of excitations, and then a single dimensionless number, capital K, which appears in these correlation functions, which is the, the so-called Luttinger parameter that uh, you know, shows up in the opposite fashion in, in these two channels, density, density, and this would be like phase ordering of, of the system. Um, and we would see here, for example, if K is very big in this bosonic system, then this thing would look like it had very long range positional order and it would kill all of the, uh, the, the condensation in this condensate fraction. Whereas in the other limit, when K goes to zero, then we basically have rapidly decaying positional order, um, but reasonably strong uh, decaying um, uh, condensate fraction. So for all of these reasons, you know, it'd be very interesting if we had some experimental platform. And so of course, people have been looking at this for a long time and not surprisingly, one of the most fruitful and exciting has been to look for this in ultra cold atoms. One can realize these kind of cigar shaped traps uh, using you know, essentially a, a network of, of 1D systems. These things are very one dimensional. And in fact, they have uh, been able to, to realize various one dimensional limits. Um, the, the relevant length scale here would be the inverse di uh, density uh, and that tells us something about the fact that you know, this is a relatively long length scale, 500 nanometers in, in this particular case. Um, if we want to think about electronic systems, and I guess I should say that, you know, not surprisingly, ultra cold here means you know, it's pico Kelvin temperatures or maybe slightly larger than that. Uh, another route would be quantum wires. Can I somehow make a, a quasi one dimensional wire that electrons can flow through? There, the, the relevant kind of confinement length scale would be the inverse Fermi wave vector, which is on the order of 50 nanometers. Um, People have done this and certainly seen some some Luttinger liquid type behavior. Uh, but again, one of the problems here is that well, one disorder is usually quite relevant in these systems. Um, again, they need to be very low density, and that low density usually means very weak interactions, especially with screening. Um, and so it's you know, and the electrons are are purely fermionic, and there's no way to access a, a bosonic um, wire in, in this kind of context. Uh, so the, this. Whoops, the, the final case of, of interest then is, is the superfluid helium case. Um, for the reasons that I said that one can swap in bosons and fermions, there's a problem here that uh, the length scales involved, the, the kind of size of the wave function in, in superfluid helium is essentially angstrom scale. And so the relevant confinement length scale is about half a nanometer. Uh, this is problematic because to make a superfluid of uh, helium-4 one-dimensional, you need to confine it somehow to be on the order of a few angstroms. That's, that's pretty tough. That's only an atom or two. Um, doing that with physical confinement, right? we have the superfluid that I can't squeeze with uh, lasers or with magnets or with electric fields. So I have to really do it physically. And I know that only below the, the uh, T lambda, this is, I'll talk more about this in a second, where the, the superfluid exists, I might have some coherence length that's larger than, uh, than a nanometer, um, but this rapidly decays. And so I really need to squeeze this thing on the order of, of an angstrom or a few angstroms. But the upside here is that it's a highly tunable system via its density. Uh, it's also relatively strongly interacting. Uh, the relative energy scale is, is much lower than, let's say, in this, this quantum wire system that's on the order of a Kelvin. And so that's why there's been kind of ongoing searches to find this, this quasi one-dimensional superfluid or a superfluid of, of helium-4. So the, the goal or the, the approach that we're going to take here towards that goal is basically nanoengineering and two different flavors of nanoengineering um, that will ultimately result in, in physical confinement uh, to a, a one-dimensional superfluid. And the two approaches that hopefully I have time to talk about both, uh, the first one is looking at single nanopores. 
And so that's basically taking a wafer of silicon nitride and blasting a hole through it and hoping that vibrations are controllable such that you can get a single cylindrical pour. Over time, that pour will tend to kind of close in. So you can see when you do a, um, a scanning SEM image of this, that it has this kind of hourglass shape. So one needs to worry about that when trying to understand its properties. So that's for a single nanopore. A completely orthogonal strategy is maybe grow some nanoporous materials. There are a few of those. The one I'll talk about is MCM41. Uh, there's others that you might have heard of like F FSM, which is folded sheet mesoporous materials. And they're essentially networks that you can fabricate uh, chemically of uh, well-ordered pores. Uh, they're usually you know, reasonably cylindrical, but may have kind of um, look like hexa hexagons or hexagonal tubes, and then they're arrayed in a, a hexagonal lattice. And so these both have their own benefits and, and drawbacks for the search that I'll tell you about. The benefit of strategy one is that I can really characterize perfectly the geometry in the system. So I can do things like compute velocities. Uh, on the right, I don't know if they have much more stuff. Right, there may only be 100 atoms inside this pore. Here I can get closer to the moles that I would need to um, actually understand the structure inside the pore. Oh, I'm getting a, a zoom crash here. Just a second. All right, can you guys still hear me? That was really weird. Yeah, it, everything looks fine now. Josh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, I didn't. Do you hear us? Okay. I can't can you, hear Josh. Can you hear me now? But it seems like people can hear me, so I will continue uh, to keep talking. All right, that was strange. Um, technology is never perfect. All right, perfect. So I'm going to share my screen again. All right, that's the problem of doing these, you know, any virtual talk is it's like you're just talking into the vacuum and, and uh, you hope that people can hear you. So let's, let's focus on this first part, which is just a, a single nanopore. Um, and you know, the first thing to do is if we want to understand superflow through a nanopore would be to understand viscous throw through a pipe. And this is the standard example that, uh, you know, is inland at Lifshitz. It's the, the hagen pusai flow in, in narrow pipe. So imagine I have just laminar flow of a viscous fluid through a cylinder described by some pressure drop delta P, P, P drain minus P source. So I have a cylinder of radius R and, and length L. And I'm getting, and I'm interested in what is the flow rate in, let's say, you know, kilograms per second of this viscid, this viscid fluid, viscous fluid um, through this, this pore. And so it turns out if one solves this relatively simple problem, not surprisingly, you find that the flow rate is dependent on the density of the fluid. It's inversely proportional to the viscosity. It depends linearly on the pressure head, the, the pressure between the source and the drain, and it scales with the fourth power. So it has a very strong dependence on, uh, on the radius. Um, and you'll note that you know, what this model would predict is that as, as R goes to zero, very rapidly, um, Q should go to zero, the mass flow should go to zero. And that's especially relevant for us up in Vermont. Uh, you know, this is why you can't drink maple syrup through a small straw, but also the way that we actually make syrup is by pulling fluid, pull, pulling syrup through, or sap, I guess I should say, um, through these small pores, but you actually have to do it with a very strong vacuum. Um, and, you know, animals in the bush will go through and, and chew through these hoses. And so if you're going for a walk in the wintertime, you hear hissing going on uh, as, uh, you know, as there's, there's holes in these things because of that vacuum pulling through. So then the question would be, well, you know, if I want to consider the anti-maple syrup, if I want to consider superfluid helium, um, what, uh, what happens in this, this regime where delta goes to zero? You know, this naively would predict that um, Q should go to infinity, but obviously that's, uh, that's too simple of a model. All right, so this is the question we want to ask. And the, the system that we're going to study is, is helium, and I'll focus on helium-4 for this talk. Um, helium-4 at low temperatures is, is a perfect quantum liquid. Its phase diagram, pressure, temperature phase diagram on the left right here looks very different than conventional elemental phase diagrams that you've likely seen. 
Uh, normally, if you cool down a liquid under its own saturated vapor pressure, it'll eventually solidify at, at, uh, at some low temperature, but that's not the case in helium. Instead, it undergoes a transition at some temperature called T lambda. You know, in condensed matter, we would just call this Tc, called T lambda due to the, the shape of the specific heat curve um, to this, this rather exotic phase of matter, the, the superfluid state. And so what happens, and here's a little video, this is a beaker of superfluid helium-4. As it hits the transition temperature, you'll see all of a sudden it becomes um, very, very still. And then if you look closely down here at the bottom of this, you'll see little droplets. And that's because under, as it undergoes the superfluid transition, you'll see the liquid level coming down. Then the lack of viscosity means that the system can actually lower its energy by spreading the helium out to take advantage of the surface interaction between the, the glass and the container and, and the helium atoms itself. And there's lots of cool videos um, that you can find if you look on YouTube of all these various properties. So can we understand why helium-4 is, is special? Well, first off, uh, helium-4 is, is a boson. Um, it's highly uh, symmetric. It has very weak interactions. So the interactions between helium atoms, it's neutral. It's just something like van der Waals. It uh, drops off very quickly. And there's some you know, short distance stuff. So this is something like a Leonard Jones potential. Um, and if I compare with, for example, neon, the first thing that should strike you is that the scale of the depth of the, the potential minimum for interactions is, is much smaller. So it's only about minus 10 Kelvin. Um, so you know, why do we get a solid? Usually we have some gas and then forms a liquid and we keep cooling it down. Eventually, at some point, uh, the system can basically minimize its energy by minimizing its potential energy. And that means putting the atoms in a regular array to take maximal advantage of the minimum of, of this potential energy curve. And that's certainly what, that, what would happen in something like neon or other elemental solids. But because of the weakness of the interaction, because helium is so small and, and symmetrical, the, you know, the electrons are really tightly bound, so the van der Waals interactions are quite weak. Um, there's another route to minimizing the energy, which is basically instead to flatten out the wave function, to, to minimize the kinetic energy related to the existence of, of zero point motion, which is quite considerable um, in, in this system. And so if one just does a, a back of the envelope calculation and computes what's the thermal to the Broglie wavelength, which scales you know, inversely with the mass, so helium is quite light, and it's already quite long, um, scales like one over the square root of temperature, it turns out that at about two Kelvin, the thermal to the Broglie wavelength is exactly equal uh, to this average separation where the atoms would like to be in a putative solid. And so there's this, you know, this alternate route to minimize the energy, which is to form this condensate. And this is, you know, again, a hand-waving argument, um, but kind of describes what's going on in, in the system and why it's so different than, for example, neon, where this thermal to rotary wavelength is just tiny. So that route doesn't exist. You can't flatten the wave function enough um, to, to deal with the, the kinetic energy. So, you know, here is, uh, so, so this is what's going on and the, the properties as a result of this transition to the superfluid state are that one, it's, it's fundamentally quantum, it's described by some macroscopic wave function. You know, I always think that's, that's amazing. Normally we think about quantum mechanics as being the study of things that are very small. Um, here's a case where you can actually have a beaker, you know, a coffee cup full of superfluid helium. It's dissipationless, the flow is, is non-entropic, and uh, something that will come up a lot is the existence of types of defects that are, are quantized vortices. So you know, that was kind of an argument for um, the existence of, of this transition. Um, but the thing that's really amazing about superflow is, is that it is indeed supports viscousless flow. Um, and this is just because of the, the available types of, of low energy excitations in a superfluid. So if I look at, let's say this is just the dispersion curve, the energy as a function of momentum in bulk superfluid helium-4, really beautiful experiments by, uh, by Henry Glyde and, and others. Um, and this solid line here is the, the energy as a function of momentum. There's some phonon branch. Again, this is because there's interactions. The, this is a, a liquid that can support density, density, or density um, waves, sound waves. Uh, and at higher momenta, uh, there's this so-called roton, which really is, is related to the existence of this putative solid that the system would like to solidify. And if one looks at what length scale this corresponds to, this momentum, it corresponds to the, the length scale of the interatomic separation in the helium solid. Um, so it doesn't come all the way down to flat, but it is there right um, to some extent. And just to see how different it is, I compare this with the dispersion curve for non-interacting bosons, just to tell you how important interactions are in the system. Then we'd have something like P squared. We would not have this, this linear branch. And there would be, although there could be a condensate fraction, like in a you know, non-interacting bose gas, the BEC, there could be no superflow.
So why is that? Well, you know, how, you know, how can we dissipate energy in the system? So I imagine that I have this, this pressure head and I have helium that's flowing. Well, I need to dissipate energy somehow if I'm going to have this friction that, that leads to the system not flowing like a superfluid. Um, and I also need to conserve energy momentum. And it turns out that in the lab frame, that's only possible if the sum of this quasi-particle energy, this, this phonon roton dispersion curve, um, plus essentially the, the piece that comes from moving to the lab frame away from the flowing frame is negative. This is the only way that I can lower the energy um, of the system, I can dissipate energy. Um, and so geometrically, one can understand that as if I want to satisfy this condition, I can just draw this line here, which has slope BS, that's the superfluid velocity, the velocity at which the superfluid is flowing. And until I have an intersection with this curve, then I can never satisfy this condition. And so that really sets this speed limit, people call the, the Landauer critical velocity, which is just saying, when is this thing basically equal to zero? And you can see that for the case of this particular dispersion curve, the first place that it meets it is this roton branch right here. It can never hit this linear curve until Vs is, is basically equal to the sound velocity. And then that would be just you know, exciting the sound waves in the system. And that's huge, hundreds and hundreds um, of meters per second. So essentially the superfluid can flow with a, a velocity up to about 60 meters per second, uh, which is when this curve hits this roton minimum. Um, and again, this is extremely different than the case of non-interacting bosons, which would be this dashed line right here, where immediately you know, at k equals zero, um, I could satisfy this constraint and so I can start dissipating energy. So although uh, uh, you know, a superfluid helium also has some condensate fraction, which is not 100% like in a BEC, because of interactions, I can depopulate the condensate, it's around 7%, it does have this amazing ability to flow without dissipation up to some critical velocity. So the summary of this is that, you know, for pressure driven flow through a pipe, the superfluid velocity should essentially be independent of channel radius. And you can compare that with the case of hagen pusai flow, uh, which it scaled like the radius to the fourth power. So that's really a, a, a dramatically um, different type of behavior. All right, so obviously people were interested to find the 60 meters per second, and there's been 50 plus years of experiments uh, put together along with some more recent ones that I, that I added in by, by Eric in a, in a review article from a number of years ago. So this is the critical velocity that was observed in a pressure-driven flow experiment as a function of the radius of the pipe that the helium was flowing through. So this is a, a number, a whole bunch of different experiments in all different types of regimes from different groups all put together on, on this one set of axes. Um, and so it'd be nice to be able to understand all of this and, and some of the more recent stuff that, uh, that is going on right now. And the first thing to note is that there's this group down here uh, for much, you know, pretty large channels uh, that have a very low critical velocity. So they, you know, they can only go so fast before they start to dissipate energy. And they're all sort of well described by this straight line on the log log plot. And it turns out that essentially those can be understand by just realizing that Landau or the, this dispersion curve in, in bulk helium missed a type of excitation that's possible in, uh, in pressure driven flow through a pipe. And that's just that I can basically, at, even at zero temperature, I can convert all the kinetic energy of flow in a pipe uh, into vortices at the exit of the channel. And this is obviously not a superfluid right here, but this is basically what's happening. You know, the only difference between superfluid hydrodynamics and classical hydrodynamics is that the circulation in the superfluid is quantized, which you know, has some um, important um, effects, but for the sake of, of thinking about the types of excitations we can cause, it, it turns out that they're, they're relatively similar in structure. So I need to worry about these vortices that weren't included in that, uh, in that bulk superfluid container where we computed the excitations. And so one can compute, you know, what is the energy of such a vortex coming out of here in a superfluid? Well, it scales with the square of the, the circulation, um, the superfluid density, not surprisingly. And because the flow field goes like one over R, I get this log R, and then that, I have to start my integral from somewhere and I do that at some microscopic scale, which is basically the coherence length. That's the scale over which you know, the system re remains coherent. In other words, that's the size of the vortex core, right? So this, the superfluid is normal inside the core and I get the superfluid velocity whipping around this thing, which gives me this kinetic energy. Such a vortex will then move. It has some momentum as you can see with these right here. And so one can then just apply the Landauer criterion to this geometry and one gets the Feynman critical velocity, which is this formula right here, which scales like one over R log R. 
So that, that's a lot on, on that slide. But this, you've already seen because this was the line right here. So the dashed line that I already drew on this plot is just the Feynman critical velocity. Okay, so these can all of these points right here can basically be fully understood uh, within this Landau critical within the, the Feynman critical velocity. But then a kind of more slightly more modern set of experiments that also introduced temperature into the mix, all of these ones up here um, came around and they were all consistently above the Landau critical velocity. Uh, so that was kind of interesting, you know, what is the mechanism that's going on up here to, to try to understand these. Um, and the way to understand those, and again, this has been known for, for a while, is, well, once we are so small, then we might not be able to, you know, we may be able to dissipate energy before the size of the vortex reaches um, the, the channel. Um, so there might be something more like intrinsic to the superfluid that's causing this dissipation. And so one can work a little bit harder on, you know, the, what's, what's going on. Uh, we have thermal energy in the system, so I can write down more generally the energy of a vortex. You've seen these two terms before. Um, one is just this, the kinetic energy of flow around it. Um, and now we put in this parameter alpha, which is related to the structure of the core that might not be so simple as it was before. And then again, we have some reduction of flow due to the, the vortex. And so what we're interested in is the critical value of this um, and this problem was studied the intrinsic critical velocity in a very famous paper from 1967, the, the Langer and Fisher. And so basically what they said is this is just a, a nucleation process. So essentially I have thermal energy and I have some barrier to create a ring vortex in, in the bulk of the superfluid um, that's characterized by this formula up here. And so if one asks what's the vortex energy in Kelvin as a function of the radius of the vortex. So now again, there's no boundary here. This is intrinsic to the superfluid. Um, then this has a, 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 a curve that has a well-defined peak inside of it. And so this is a, a usual nucleation phenomena such that if I don't have enough energy or if my radii of my vortices are too small, they'll just tend to shrink and won't be effective at creating dissipation in the system. So along this whole branch right here, I won't be able to successfully dissipate energy by creating these vortices. But once I get above this, then I can drive nucleation type phenomena where my vortices will grow and start to dissipate energy. So it's a simple nucleation process. So we know how to deal with that. Well, I have some driving pressure in the system. That's the Delta P. Um, that's the pressure driven flow. I'm pushing that energy into the system and I'm asking how is that energy being dissipated? So I can convert that into a chemical potential and that energy is then being dissipated via this, this production or nucleation of vortices at some rate. So there's a drive rate that corresponds to the pressure there's an attempt rate in this usual nucleation process that's just related to geometric properties of, of the system and, and the vortices. And then the barrier height that I need to get over is just this energy of the vortex. So I basically need to find the critical radius, this peak right here, that will give me um, the solution to this equation. And from that, I can figure out the critical velocity. So Langer and Fisher did this in 1967. They knew that the kind of maximum that had ever been seen for, for critical velocities was on the order of 20 meters per second. The Landau critical velocity is way up here, that's 60 meters per second. And so their target was to get this 20 meters per second. They knew what the attempt rate should be, about 10 to the 12 hertz. Again, you can compute this just from intrinsic properties of the superfluid. And so it turns out this is you know, the external drive rate. In order to get 20 meters per second, they had to compute this ridiculously small number for the drive rate, the pressure driving the flow to see this which was 10 to the minus 23 hertz. And that really doesn't make any sense. That's a ludicrously small, um, corresponds to a ludicrously small pressure. And you know, I've talked to many people about this. This always fascinated me that this number was so many orders of magnitude off. Uh, if, if you ask about you know, reasonable pressures on the order of millibars, they're 20 orders of magnitudes uh, larger than this or more. So how did this number stick around for, for so many years? And you know, Baron and I were talking about this at some point and we thought, well, there's gotta be some reason for this that, that we can figure out. And that was kind of the impetus of this piece of, of the work. Um, it turns out rather simply uh, in a way that the, the best information that was available about the structure of a vortex core at the time was basically a hollow core of some very small radius, two angstroms or something like that. And that when you actually optimize, do the optimization problem, that uh, this core radius, which is this coherence length here, C, comes in in a highly nonlinear way. In fact, it has an exponential dependence on this, this vortex core size. And so I can see that in the following way. So this is the same uh, function for the energy that we already saw. 
And we know now that the, you know, this, the coherence length of a superfluid, it's just 3D XY, uh, has this kind of form where this C dot is the, the zero temperature coherence length. And at the time in 1967, people thought that this was gonna be just a rigid core of, of normal helium inside the vortex. And in order to get this per, uh, experimentally observed 20 meters per second, they needed this ludicrously large um, value here. Uh, since then, there's been Quantum Monte Carlo by uh, uh, David Agali and others, and also some nice experiments that have said that actually this C naught is not two, it's 3.45, okay? So you say, well, that's only a factor of, you know, of uh, not so much. How can it be less than a factor of two? Um, how can it be such a big deal? Well, it turns out if you, if you look at this optimization problem that allows you to find the, the, the right um, radius size, this critical radius size, so this is a sort of a complicated plot here. This is the drive frequency on the y-axis, the core radius on the x-axis, and the false color or the color here is the critical velocity. Langer and Fisher knew that they needed to get about 20 meters per second. So that's this kind of green color right here. And so they, they fixed C naught to be two, and they needed to, to tune gamma to be 80. But it turns out that because of this highly non-linear non way that um, C comes into things, that uh, if you use this 3.45, the more modern one, you can get a drive frequency that's much more in line with on the order of millibars. And so that's basically the solution to this problem is just change C naught by a factor of two um, that, that gave you, you know, 20 orders of magnitude incorrect answer in the drive frequency. So we're relatively happy to you know, have, have discovered the origin of that and now we know that this new information on the core radius is really essential. All right, so that's the, that's the nucleation dominated intrinsic regime. So we understand up here, these are really large pores. Basically temperature has no effect. We're converting all the kinetic energy of flow into vortices that are the size of the channel. Then there's this nucleation dominated regime where we can actually nucleate vortices that are smaller, that have a, a radius that are smaller than the size of the channel. Um, and we can understand that dissipation purely as a nucleation phenomena to get predict this kind of critical velocities. But more recently, you know, we're interested in this question of what happens when we, we move to one dimensions. We want the radius of the channel to be on the order of the coherence length, which we know now to be half an angstrom or so. So we already visited that. So Guillaume and, and Peter Taborek have started to do some systematic experiments in this regime where they're able to, to make individual pores um, and actually approach this one dimensional limit. And they're starting to see some stuff that looks significantly different than anything that's been seen before. In fact, as the radius gets smaller, uh, Guillaume found that the superfluid, the critical velocity actually decreased. And so that's starting to think about, well, maybe there's just some new types of dissipation mechanisms. This would be backscattering in the, in the Luttinger liquid approach um, that uh, might start to persist in this R goes to zero limit. But it's hard to get small, right? For the reasons that I said, I need to actually confine my system on the scale of angstroms. And so I really need to devise a flow geometry like this, where I have a something like a nanopore, something on the order of a, a nanometer radius. I need to be able to fully characterize all of its properties so that I can compute velocities. I force superfluid helium to go through this, this nanopore, and then I count individual atoms. And this thing might only have a couple hundred atoms in it. So I need a mass spectrometer that can basically count individual atoms, you know, picograms per second or something like that. And I pull this out into vacuum. I need a huge pressure to be able to, to suck through, uh, suck superfluid through this. But then for anyone that, you know, has worked in low temperature physics, um, I need to actually glue this nanopore into this flow geometry and I'm going to get leaks. And, you know, this is like a, extremely difficult set of experiments that have taken many years and, and many, you know, the, the epic work of various graduate students where you make a hole, you put it in the geometry, and then 12 hours later, you know, you cool it down, you check if there's any flow. And if there isn't, you don't know if um, it's plugged or if there was no hole or if you did something wrong and you have to start all over again. So there's some really epic experiments done by, um, by Peter's group and by Guillaume's uh, group to get this. And then you can actually measure the velocity if you can do this. And so as I said, there's these two approaches. One is, is Guillaume's approach, which are these kind of hourglass shaped nanopores that are usually not very long. They might only be 30 nanometers long, but they can be very, very small on the order of uh, six nanometers, or sorry, six, yeah, six nanometers in, uh, in diameter. Um, an alternative approach taken by Peter Taborik's group in Irvine is very, very long nanometers, very, very long nanopores that can be on the order of microns, but they're much fatter. 
Um, and there's really two shapes, these hourglass shapes or the channel shapes. So what we wanted to do is see if we could, you know, predict from first principles what type of new excitations might be showing up inside, uh, inside the pore. And to do that, we had to generalize this, this vortex energy to take account of all possible excitations. So now, because the pore is so small, we can't just have ring vortices. We can have different types of sort of line vortices that start and terminate on the edges, on the boundaries of the system. And moreover, if you have you know, a large system, then you can assume that the flow, the background superflow is just constant flow. But that's not the case in these constrictions where now we can have complicated flow profiles. And so one needs to have a much more general expression that includes a, the flow profile. Otherwise, it just looks the same as before. Um, and so we looked at two different flow profiles, a channel flow, which is pretty uniform except at the entrance and exit, and then this much more extreme orifice flow profile that basically has even divergent flow. So these are two cases where we can actually compute the flow profile, super flow profile exactly inside these, where for us an orifice means a hyperbola that's rotated around the axis. So now we have access to this VS. We can do, we can imagine all types, types of uh, defects inside a pore, line vortices, ring vortices, you know, different orientations. We have a larger configurational space of where do these sit, what are their size, how do they terminate, all kinds of uh, degrees of freedom. Then we can do a basically a large scale numerical optimization problem to determine you know, how the, the first set of defects that becomes available to dissipate energy at a given temperature. So that's what we did. Um, that was kind of 2017. Uh, and then in the last couple of years, we said, well, wouldn't it be great if we could test this on, uh, on experiments in Guillaume and, and Peter's group? Um, so the, the first piece of this was actually getting both of them to give us their data and all work together. So that turned out to be uh, fun. Um, and the interesting thing for us is that these two approaches are, as I said, completely different. So Guillaume blasts single holes inside some silicon nitride membrane. They tend to have radii between 3 and 20 nanometers, but the length is completely fixed by the thickness of the, the membrane, which is about 30 nanometers. And so the prediction from us would be that for the very, very, you know, 10 nanometers in, uh, in radius and 30 nanometers long, this thing should totally be like an orifice. It's going to close in in the center. It's not a very stable pore. Um, we would say that that thing's like an orifice. But for his longest pores with the smallest radii, that should look like channel flow. Whereas Peter, who does chemical etching, can make these beautifully long and very straight, perfect looking nanopores that uh, you know, can be 10 microns long, but they're limited to rather larger radii, 15 to 80 nanometers. This is a, a micrograph over here. And so the prediction for Peter is that they're well described by channel flow. The, the aspect ratio, sorry, that's what these are, I didn't say, is, is 1,000 to 1 um, for him. And both of them use essentially the same geometry. They have a high pressure reservoir of superfluid helium. It has to flow through this resistive element, which is the nanopore. Then there's vacuum on this side, it goes to a pump system and you count individual atoms via a mass spectrometer. This thing obviously has to be in a big box to make sure that you're not picking up atmospheric helium um, because we're literally interested in counting individual atoms here. So here are the results. I'll just kind of walk through them. They're, they're, we're pretty happy with them. So this is Guillaume's results are the data points here. This is the critical velocity as a function of temperature below the lambda point. It's experimental data for two systems, um, his two longest pores, but they also have relatively large radii. And so the prediction here would be when it's one to one, when the length is the same as the diameter, this thing should be like an orifice. And that's this long, or this, this dark gray right here, corresponding to the pink points. But as, this thing starts to be more channel-like, it starts to cross over to this channel flow boundary, which is the light gray line right here. And in this case, um, we expect that it's still wide enough, the, the radius of the pore is big enough that it should be ring vortices that are the dominant uh, mechanism. Um, and so we can actually distinguish between orifice and channel flow and the vortex type in these experiments. Uh, Peter's experiments are in this totally different regime. So these are you know, 50 nanometers long. Peter's pores are 10 microns long, so they're huge. He can do things at different pressures. And again, we find that essentially ring vortices are the, are the dominant type of excitation, except at potentially very, uh, very low pressures um, where there may be line vortices emanating from the entrance and exit where there is some uh, non-channel-like flow. Uh, so here's the theory. These are Peter's um, points. And there's zero fit parameters. That's kind of the amazing thing about this. We input into this optimization problem uh, the mass of helium, the temperature, the geometry, and the flow profile. 
and we let it run and it spits out a critical velocity. Um, and essentially this is a, a way where we can microscopically diagnose dissipation in these mesoscale superfluids. So what about the one dimensional limit? Um, this is a really busy plot. This is Guillaume's most recent data on the smallest pore that's ever been measured. It has a radius of only three nanometers. The length is 30, so the, you know, it's, it's 10 to one approximately. Our prediction was this thing should cross over to channel flow as opposed to the, um, uh, the orifice flow. And so all of the predictions that you see on here, the lines, which are our theory, are for channel flow. And again, we look at both ring vortices and line vortices at different pressures. All the data points here correspond to, to different pressure, pressure heads. And we can essentially quantitatively describe the data over a relatively large uh, temperature regime um, down to a point where, rather interestingly, the nucleation theory starts to break down and, and we have some understanding of, of, of why that might be. You know, one could be entering into a regime where you have additional dissipation coming from new types of vortices, again, at the entrance and exit, or maybe even um, quantum fluctuations. I had a question on the previous slide. Yep. So uh, about this point that there are no fitting parameters, I'm just trying to figure out what goes into the theory and you said it, but it went by very quickly. So I guess there must be some hydrodynamic parameters that are going in there, like the, the superfluid velocity, uh, Things like so, the, that. so the only thing that goes in is, uh, so we basically know all the properties of, of helium in these systems. We know as a function of temperature, what the superfluid fraction should be, the density. Mm -hmm. um, we obtain the flow profile based on the geometry that's given to us by the experimentalist. Mm -hmm. Either this channel, you know, we know its radius, we know something about the entrance and exit from these SEM images. Um, and so, so there is, I mean, so, so I guess my main question is about the former. So in terms of, so exactly what helium properties are you using? So the superfluid fraction you said in the density, are those the only two or are there others? And then um, are, are you using those that are empirically determined or do they come from other? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, I would say the, the main um, place that we don't have a lot of information about is what is the superfluid density inside one of these pores? So ultimately we use the bulk superfluid density, um, but from certain torsion os torsional oscillator measurements in these low dimensional systems, we know that there could be some suppression of the, the superfluid density as a function of temperature, um, but uh, not a huge amount. So that, that is one, you know, one thing that we don't know for sure. We have to input at a given temperature um, and pressure. We know from experiments, basically the full pressure temperature superfluid density um, values are, are known from experiments over the last 50 years or so. Okay, perfect. So what would be wonderful is if we could do like a little Andros Kavili experiment inside these pores, right? We'd love to know what the actual superfluid fraction was, um, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, but that I mean, cool. in some sense, you, if you did put a fit parameter in there, these experiments might give you a way to determine it's a good question. Yeah, it's a good point. So we could we could try to back out. And, and you know, that was the original idea was a lot of the, the work on dissipation in these systems is so empirical, you just guess. And so the idea here was at least for different types of dissipation mechanism, ring vortices versus line vortices, we could maybe distinguish between them. But it's a, it's a good idea to try to back out what the, the superfluid fraction might be for a given type of vortex or dissipation avenue. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so, so the gist of this is that, you know, if, if one looks at all these experiments and, and carefully goes through them, we can basically describe them all within this theory, and this theory relies on the existence of vortices. Um, and those vortices, th their existence at all means that the radius of the channels that uh, the superfluid is going through is not yet at this one dimensional regime, this uh, approximately equal to the coherence length. If you actually plug in the numbers, we're always you know, on the order of a few, 5C. So we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. The next generation that both Guillaume and, and Peter and others are working on right now um, are really approaching this limit. Uh, and there, they are even harder because the, the flow rate decreases. Um, we have some theory for what should happen there. The first thing that should happen is just be crossover to something like a superfluid version of, of Langram and McCumber Halperin theory that describes fluctuations in low dimensional superconductors. Um, we have some predictions for that. And then eventually backscattering um, in, in the Tomonaga Lutinger liquid. So that's kind of the next, the next piece. So maybe I'll 
stop there. I, I can tell you more about what happens when you have many pores, but that's probably another 10 minutes. And I don't know if people want to, to hear um, 10 more minutes of me. So that would be the option. I can either answer some questions um, if there are on this stuff, or I could plow ahead and, and give you a flavor of, of the other things that we're doing on this. So maybe we'll stop for questions briefly and see if there are any questions now. Sure. So please just unmute yourself. Okay, so maybe like right now, there doesn't seem to be that many questions. So I think we have enough time if you'd like to. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go a little bit further. I'll just kind of give you a flavor of, of the next thing, which is basically from one board to many. Um, and so we, we move from a, you know, a top down to a, a bottom up approach where the idea is, is to chemically fabricate materials that are porous um, and somehow control the size of those pores. And the motivation for doing that is basically to understand the structure and excitations inside. Because although we can beautifully determine the critical velocity with these single pores, um, as I said, there's only maybe a, a few thousand atoms inside, and that's not enough to, to get any reasonable scattering signal on. And so one really needs to, to fill these large nanoporous arrays with enough stuff that you can actually do scattering, neutron scattering, for example. Um, but here, the, the pore size is, is really set by chemistry. Um, but the absolute lower limit, which is related to the size of the surfactant molecules that are used in, in these systems, this one that I've shown here is MCM41, um, is, is kind of an ultimate lower limit. So one can't really get smaller than about three nanometers. That's the, the smallest size that, uh, that you could get. And people have, have looked at helium inside this, as I mentioned. Uh, they've done uh, torsional oscillator type experiments where you take the whole thing, you fill it up with helium, and you slosh it back and forth, and you look for some piece of the superfluid that might be decoupling. That would be some you know, non-classical um, uh, moment of inertia fraction. And, and they have observed qualitative differences from the bulk. So this is this pressure temperature phase diagram that I showed you earlier, and the dashed line would be the bulk regime. And so they see some suppression and they see some signal or some broadening, uh, some softening of, of excitations. Um, but really what's going on inside this is, is not understood at all. Uh, when uh, and Paul Sokol and, and some others did neutron scattering inside MCM41 that was filled with helium. So you take this nanoporous material, you fill it up with, uh, with superfluid helium, you cool it down below T lambda and you shoot neutrons in um, and you excite these oscillations or the, these excitations and, and you measure the dispersion relation. Um, so Paul did this at very low temperatures. You can see here 49 millikelvin and 33 millikelvin. This is the same curve I showed you earlier um, compared with the, the bulk curve showing this, this linear dispersion down here and then this roton. And all Paul found as, as a difference in this MCM material filled with superfluid helium was a slight softening of the roton mode but this is the, the comparison with the bulk right here. Um, but otherwise, the excitations inside the pore look totally 3D. And there's some softening, but not all the way down. Looks totally 3D, nothing exciting going on. This was kind of surprising. Why didn't this confined helium show more evidence of, uh, of being 1D? And the answer, which we kind of addressed from a simulation standpoint, was that inside these pores, if they're not really, really small, they actually do look like bulk. This is again related to this very small coherence length. Um, essentially, this is a plot of the density of particles inside the core as a function of the radial distance from the center of the pore. And the gray here is just the location of the particles, it's just the volume density. So what one finds is that you get a, a strong buildup of superfluid near the walls, and then you get this set of concentric shells. So think about it, you know, if I pour water on a surface, I get a bunch of layers. Um, and if I roll that into a cylinder, then I'm just going to get a bunch of cylinders. Um, and having any kind of superfluid in the, in the center of this thing requires some fine tuning of the radius, such that I can have an integer number of shells plus a central core right here. And then if you actually look at superfluidity, it turns out that only this core really goes superfluid. And so you need to squeeze, you need the radius to be uh, sufficiently small and well registered such that you can realize this, this tiny little superfluid core. So we need to get really small, you know, three nanometers is kind of the, the limit set by uh, the chemistry. We need to get down to let's say one nanometer. Um, 
So Paul, uh, Paul Sokol and I were talking about ways to do this. And one of the ways that we came up with, which again, other people had tried in different contexts, was would there be a way to pre-plate these, these MCM41, these nanoporous materials with kind of a, a just some stuff. Um, in this case, solid argon, which would then give us a smaller radius to play with, where we could then have you know, the pore wall, that's MCM, then we'd put in some argon, then that would freeze to the wall, and then we put helium inside of that. And then maybe right at the center, that would give us the ability to tune into this sweet spot you know, the, the, where we could realize this 1D liquid. And there is some evidence from x-ray diffraction. This is just looking at the charge distribution as a function of radius, that if you put in different pressures of argon inside this MCM41, you could actually relatively tune, um, tune the radius. So that gave us some hope that this would work. And so Paul did this, he grew MCM41, he pre-plated with argon and did a BET analysis and, and extracted a radius of the pore to be about 15.5 angstrom. So that's the, the three nanometers in diameter that I told you about. Um, but then he was able to freeze that argon inside the pore and then do another isotherm. So this is the, you know, the, the basically the, the number of atoms inside the pore as a function of pressure. Um, he put in helium inside that argon preplated MCM41 and did another BT analysis and found that indeed one could get down into this sweet spot regime where the radius is on the order of, of 12 angstroms that we've looked at in, in previous simulations. So this again is, is quite exciting. There's tunability here because one can slightly tune the density of this argon preplated layer and move this on the order of maybe like a half angstrom or something like that. So this is brand new, unpublished stuff. Uh, you know, working, we're working on the data analysis. This is this uh, larger pore without preplating, where we saw something in the excitation spectrum that looked just like bulk helium, except for maybe some softening near the roton. Um, but what Paul did is he subtracted off the, the background layers from the existence of the argon and looked at this helium inside argon preplated MCM41 and finds a drastically different scattering profile. So now there's something that comes down all the way uh, to, to zero. Um, this roton's completely come down and there's this strong branch of scattering that you can see maybe some hint of something coming off both to smaller Q and larger Q at this, uh, this wave vector right here. This is at, at 1.5 Kelvin. And what's rather exciting about this is this looks a lot like what you might expect if you just had hardcore bosons in 1D. So you have hardcore bosons in 1D, there's a lot of stuff on this, but the dominant feature that you see is basically the existence of even for bosons in 1D, the existence of something like a, a Fermi wave vector, um, where you should see strong linear scattering coming off of that. And that seems to be uh, what's in here. And just doing some phenomenological modeling, one can even do things like extract a let interparameter from this. So this is very preliminary, but we're quite excited about that. Um, but we really wanted to understand the microscopics of this scattering and, and compare with Monte Carlo. And so the, the thing that we spent the last, let's say, year doing was basically trying to build an effective theoretical model of this confinement environment inside the pore. And we did that by starting from essentially the crystal structure of this MCM41 as grown and, and building. So this is a, a model of the interaction potential that a helium atom would see inside this material. You can see these pores look pretty cylindrical. So that's a, a close-up of one of the pores. We can compute this exact uh, atomic potential for a helium atom inside the space. Um, then we can fit this to some effective uh, theoretical model of this potential, which is quite simple, just a, a, a perfect cylindrical pore. That's this right here. So this is gonna be our environment inside the simulation for a single nanopore. And then we can add the layer of argon um, and then get a new effective confinement potential, which is what this is. So this is a radial cut the, the confinement potential that a helium atom inside this MCM41 preplated with argon would see. This is the unargon plated one here. And we can see that we can shift the effective radius of the pore by quite a bit. And we can tune the location and the, by tuning the, the dense and the, the height um, by tuning the density of argon. So we perform simulations, large scale QMC, quantum Monte Carlo inside these pores. Um, we can pull out essentially adsorption isotherms to compare with the experiment. They compare quite well. So this is the density inside the pore as a function of either pressure or chemical potential. Um, we see these step-like features which correspond to individual layers forming inside the pore as we tune the chemical potential. And you can see that here in this little video where as I increase the pressure or chemical potential, I start growing this, the shells one at a time. 
And eventually at the center, I do realize this one dimensional liquid um, right here in the center. And so that's kind of where we are right now. We're exploring the properties and the tunability of this, this one dimensional liquid. Because we know the density, we can then map back what we expect the Luttinger parameter might be in the system and see if that uh, agrees with, uh, with what Paul is seeing in these preliminary scattering experiments. Um, the tunability will exist only in this kind of narrow pressure window, which corresponds to being able to tune the density inside the core. But still, there's some exciting regime uh, where that, that might in fact be realizable. So that's a lot, multiple orthogonal directions on, on realizing a 1D superfluid. Um, but uh, the first piece is this kind of quantitative theory we think we have for mesoscale dissipation. And uh, we're working with various experimental groups to try to fit or understand their results in, in terms of this theory. Um, and the current generation is still quasi 3D in these types of single pore experiments, but we're hopeful that uh, we'll get there in, in the next generation. And the second part is this pre-plating that we can use to, to reduce the effective dimension to 1D. Um, the, and the ex excitations that are not bulk phonons and rotons, but they might have the features of these 1D hardcore bosons. Um, so again, the, the future experiments, what we're trying to do right now is carefully tune the pressure. So you can find you know, all of our, our codes are open source for doing this stuff, either on our websites or our GitHub. Um, and you know, if, you, if you're a student that is interested in a postdoc, we do have some postdoc positions available. So I'll, I'll stop now and, and hopefully there's some questions I can answer. Okay. So if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves. Yeah, I guess big, big picture, what are the biggest open questions right now that, you know, things that uh, there's a pressing need to understand or are of extreme, you know, the, of interest that connect to other areas or anything like this? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think that the, the most interesting thing would be this post Fermi correspondence. So, you know, obviously in, in the cold atom systems, we can look at fermions and bosons, um, but not necessarily in, in identical geometries, we need different lasers. And, and so here would be a case where you can essentially pure, you can tune the mixture of bosons and fermions um, also, which you can do in cold atoms, but in a regime that is basically a very high densities. And so I think there's, there's lots of stuff there to play with around what happens to correlation functions in this regime, especially if we can measure them um, in these experiments. So that would be the one piece. And the other, the other piece would really be to understand backscattering in this Lunger liquid regime. So the, you know, the, the equivalent place to look would just be quasi 1D superconductors, um, where there you again have different types of backscattering mechanisms. Um, but to, to have a, a again, a, a semi quantitative theory to understand what those dissipation mechanisms are, um, would be interesting to be able to predict things like why you know, the, the, um, the condensate fraction in bulk superfluid helium is in the order of 7%. And you know, we, we really don't have a, a microscopic theory of why, where that number comes from. I mean, it's just some non-universal number, but the idea would be to you know, better understand the types of interactions um, by, by, make, by pushing this, this system into a regime where we can actually do some theoretical modeling that's not just quantum Monte Carlo. Yeah, I was just gonna say, so uh, is quantum Monte Carlo able to fairly accurately reproduce these numbers, DMC or path integral or something, or? Yeah, so in, so in terms of the, the, you know, just equilibrium properties, it always shocks me that you, you, know, you can literally throw 250 helium atoms in a box on a classical computer and uh, stick in the interaction between helium atoms that's known from scattering experiments and uh, you know, cool down the system um, and put in the mass and you'll get T lambda to one decimal place. So the, you know, for the pure bosonic system in, in the liquid phase and the bulk system, we can understand this thing perfectly with QMC. Um, the non-equilibrium cases are another you know, piece altogether. We don't really know what, you know, what, what to do there to understand the flow. And the types of dissipation, you know, there are models for vortices, but there the types of length scales that can be modeled are more like millimeters. So this is vortex tangle theories and things like that, but they're nowhere in this, uh, this kind of nanoscale regime. So any other questions? <laughs> 
So I had a quick question. So um, a few weeks ago, uh, Professor Damson talked about a QO5. Basically, if you were to hypothetically consider a helium four like superfluid with decreasing mass, very interesting things would happen to the superfluid phase diagram. So basically, this increases at the Bohr parameter, and basically, a, the phase diagram of helium four uh, changed drastically. So how do you think things would change in the one D limit? Yeah, so you know it would become more quantum if you reduce the the mass further. Um, I mean, obviously, it would have a large effect on on the Luttinger parameter. Um, you might be able to enter that regime. So normally, you know, if you just take helium and put it in one D, uh, it really does want to kind of quasi solidify. That's the you know the the standard way it would be, and that's because in in one D, um, you know, there's not a lot of ability to spread things out quite as much, and so you'd like to be in a, a regime where this thing really flows, um, and so potentially you could tune into a more superfluid like regime, even though it'd still be, you know, everything's quasi long range ordered, but you might be able to get something that has stronger uh, superfluid like properties. Okay, thank you. So, any other questions? Stop sharing. Okay, so if there aren't any more questions, maybe let's thank Professor Don Maestro one more time. All right, thanks, Josh. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming.